Casanova. I am the co-chair of the Sociology Colloquium series along with my fellow co-chair, Dr. Danielle Bissett. Uh, shout out to Dr. Bissett. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to our annual Taft Lecture, which is sponsored by the Taft Memorial Fund and the Department of Sociology. Each year, sociology faculty and graduate students vote on who they want to bring to UC to speak about their work. And this year, we chose Dr. Mary Patillo, who is how, not how, Harold Washington Professor of Sociology and African American Studies at Northwestern University. So we'll take all afternoon to do justice to Dr. Patillo's impressive career, so I'm just going to give you the highlights. Um, she's the author of two books, Black Picket Fences, Privilege and Peril Among the Black Middle Class, and Black on the Block, The Politics of Race and Class in the City. She's also co-editor of Imprisoning America, The Social Effects of Mass Incarceration. In 2000, Black Picket Fences won the Oliver Cromwell Cox Award from the American Sociological Association's Racial and Ethnic Minorities Section. And the same year, it received an honorable mention for the ASA's Robert E. Park Award for the best book in community and urban studies. Urban sociology, sorry. <coughs> uh, this book, if you don't know it, is based on an ethnographic study of Groveland, which is a majority black uh, neighborhood in Chicago. And if you haven't read the fascinating analyses of everything from language use to young people's consumption of Nike products, um, you have some homework for this weekend. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> black on the Block was selected by the Chicago Tribune as one of its favorite books of 2007. And it was also honored by the city of Chicago with a special resolution. I wanted to know, did you get a key to the city with that? <laughs> well, you should have. You should have. And this book, uh, which you should also read if you haven't already, prospective grad students, grad students, um, focuses on gentrification of a historically black Chicago uh, neighborhood uh, by middle class African Americans. Uh, in her review of the book for the journal City and Community, Sandra Barnes wrote that, quote, Black on the Block provides an important response to questions regarding what constitutes the black community and the concept of middle class by refuting dichotomies or simplistic characterizations of a monolithic black community. Dr. Patillo has been chosen as one of Newsweek's women of the 21st century, Chicago Tribune's top 30 under 30, and she's received grants and fellowships from the Ford Foundation and the Fulbright Hayes Program, among others. Uh, in addition to her research and teaching, she serves on the board of the Urban Prep Charter Academy High School in Chicago. Uh, the title of her talk today I know you can read, but it's Race, Poverty, and the Rise of Choice Policies. So let's welcome her to the University of Cincinnati. Thank you very much, Anne, for that uh, very gracious introduction. And it really is a pleasure. Thank you all for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, and I've really enjoyed my time since I've been here. So I'm going to begin by talking about the motivations for this research, and then get to uh, what I'll be talking about. The project I'll be talking about is new research, and so it is much more open for questions and your feedback than if this were something published where I might listen and say, oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I really am looking for feedback. So there are two motivations for this research. I begin with a story from my book, Black on the Block, about school reform in a Chicago neighborhood that I studied for over five years. The neighborhood is located on the south side of the city, along the lakefront, and a few minutes from the University of Chicago. The neighborhood is nearly 100% African American, and in the 1970s and 1980s, it had one of the highest poverty rates of any neighborhood in the city. In the early 1990s, it was rediscovered by developers and, um, and the city of Chicago itself, and middle and upper income African Americans. In other words, the neighborhood began to gentrify and the schools were one object of concern and focus for many of the new families. When the North Kenwood Oakland Conservation Plan, which was the city, official city document about how this neighborhood would be revitalized, when that conservation plan was approved in 1992, there were three operating public elementary schools and one public high school in the neighborhood, and all of them had abysmal records. When Mayor Richard M. Daley took control of Chicago Public Schools in 1995, the four-year graduation rate at the high school was 58%. 23% of the students there were chronically truant. In 1995, at Price Elementary School in North Kenwood, fewer than 10% of the students were performing at or above national norms in reading and math. The students at Robinson uh, Elementary School in Oakland performed only marginally better. The third elementary school was closed down for low enrollment. 
It is no secret that high on the list of the things that people think about when choosing a neighborhood is thinking about choosing its schools. And the schools in North Kenwood, Oakland in the early days of its revitalization were anything but attractive choices. The public discourse on school reform always emphasizes improving educational options for all families, including low-income residents. But the reform, available reform tools, things like schools with selective enrollment criteria, charter schools, small <coughs> schools, make school reform more exclusive than, it, than its rhetoric suggests. Though none of these strategies privatizes public education, as critics often assert, each of the options available to North Kenwood Oakland activists put limits on the ability of neighborhood families to take advantage of the new schools that went into the neighborhood. So here we have, um, what I'm showing you here are the test scores at the new schools in North Kenwood, Oakland. This is from 2004-2005. Uh, is this something like a pointer? No. No. Oh, it says pointer there. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Watch, I'm going to press this and it'll blow up. No. Okay, we'll just, okay, so this sometimes works though. There we go. Okay, so um, these are the elementary schools. These are the ones I just mentioned, Price and Robinson. These are the two new elementary schools, a charter school and a small school, which basically means it has caps on enrollment. Um, it also has some non-neighborhood children. And Fuller is a nearby elementary school that some of the students go to as well. And so again, these are the two new schools. They're the two first of um, these two bars, right? So what you see in the new schools are lower percent of the, of the children are low income. These are qualifying for free or reduced lunch. So in the new schools, lower percentages of low income children, um, higher test scores except for some competition by Jackie Robinson, although the, the more recent data show further uh, a widening of this gap than even these data show. And that's at the, that's the reading um, uh, test score outcomes. And here are the math test score outcomes, and you see an even greater gap for math. But again, in the most recent data, that gap is even greater. Uh, this is high schools? No, did it go? Yes, this is high schools. And so King College Prep had been King, or Martin Luther King High School that wasn't a college prep school, and what happened was is the Chicago Public Schools emptied out of the school, let all the kids graduate, it sat closed, underwent an $18 million renovation, it was reopened as a college prep school, which is a selective enrollment school. So in some respects, the fact that the uh, test scores are higher than its uh, neighborhood options makes sense because kids had to test in to get there. Again, you see a much lower percentage of low-income kids at King College Prep as opposed to Diet and Phillips. Diet and Phillips are the local neighborhood traditional public schools. Here you see their test scores much lower than the test scores at King. Um, and Kenwood, uh, the uh, alma mater of Professor, Let <laughs> Professor Letitia, is right here. Um, and I, I put Kenwood here only because it's called Kenwood, and the neighborhood is called North Kenwood, Oakland, and one might assume that kids from North Kenwood, Oakland might go to Kenwood, but they don't. Kenwood is for South Kenwood, uh, and North Kenwood Open goes to these other schools. So even though this school seems to be performing better and has a, a greater socioeconomic mix, it's not the school that kids in the neighborhood can go to. So contemporary school reform focuses on choice and the personal initiative of residents who must choose from an array of resources avail available from the state. The model has changed from one in which cities and governments deliver public services, like education, health care, and protection from crime, to one in which uh, residents shop for these goods in a service landscape that includes more non-governmental non -governmental, and sometimes even private subcontractors. This same thing is true in the housing sector, where since the 1970s, the federal government has tried to get out of the housing business altogether, and the housing provision business, to instead give families vouchers and allow them to choose into privately rented apartments. And that would be a second part of this story. Right, there's a little feedback, right, yeah. on the microphone.